So the big question is this, how are real estate investors who don't have a ton of free time, don't have access to off-market deals, and didn't start life on third base? How do we grow a real estate business conservatively to support our families, finally leave the corporate rat race, and build a legacy? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. I'm Ed Matthews, and this is Real Estate Underground. This is the Real Estate Underground podcast show number 57. Hey, everybody, Ed Matthews here with the Real Estate Underground. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today is an interesting uh, uh, conversation. Um, you know, we're here with Scott Crone. Uh, and uh, Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for your, your time today. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Me too. I'm excited about this. So Scott, you have a very interesting business model, um, you know, in terms of repositioning uh, commercial buildings into a, uh, a, a very impressive self-storage portfolio. So um, I would love to hear about that since this is certainly an asset class that I pay attention to and uh, aspire to getting into at one point or another, either passively or actively. So uh, I'm glad we're talking today. Thanks. I, it, you're, it's interesting because not too many people say interesting in self storage. You know, it's not usually the right. common yeah. <laughs> denominator, right? Yeah. Uh, the other question is, did you grow up thinking about self storage? And yeah. you know, the answer is no. I did not dream Definitely of self storage right. as a kid, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it, it's an an involvement, uh, something that has grown out of my architectural background when I was getting yeah. my master's and was doing multifamily, and then it's uh, just progressed into simplifying the box. You know, yeah. um, you know, yours is a little bit more complex than mine at this point in time, but, you Same know, man. we've done, uh, you know, $14 million homes and done multifamily and done a uh, hundred thousand dollar homes. And now we're doing, you know, hundred dollar boxes. Right. Right. And so, you know, with, um, with code of management, your company, um, so you have looked at, it's interesting. So right now your focus is, is self-storage. You know, you look at like how self-storage has performed over the years versus like, you know, multifamily, let's choose that since that's the world I know, you know, and on average, you know, multifamily is, is performed in that 13-ish percent um, return where self-storage uh, is upwards of 17%, if I'm not mistaken, maybe even better at this point. I, I would say um, the aggregate, you know, if you're just looking at existing facilities yeah. and how they performed Wide versus numbers, right? the development side. Um, so Anytime you're you're dealing with development, I think it it always gets a little bit more robust in terms of the rate of returns. Um, or you can change the program, and that's what we really focus on is how we can change the program of the property in order to maximize the value of it. Right. But um, I would agree with you. I, I think one of the differences is that multifamily has uh, is tied more to the interest rate. You know, so as interest rates drop, people were leaving multifamily to go condo or homes because they could afford it. Right. Now the interest rates rising, you know, it's going to probably push them back into multifamily. Yep. And, uh, you know, the thing that always drew me to, uh, to, to start to pay attention to self-storage, uh, one is, uh, I, I, I met a guy, uh, AJ Osborne, who's one of your competitors out there. And, uh, we had a really interesting talk at a bigger pockets, uh, event a, a long time ago. And so I've been fascinated by it ever since, but the, um, you know, the other piece of it is the, uh, you know, similar returns, actually a little bit superior, right? Uh, but no infrastructure, no plumbing, no uh, HVAC, uh, and no human beings, which is uh, an interesting, you know, certainly removes complexity from the old, the overall business model, right? Yes and no. I mean, uh, yeah. we, we do have one or two toilets in our buildings and we do have HVAC because we do climate control. Right. And so um, a little bit, but I mean, as, as one person recently said to me, like, you got rid of the people and just kept their stuff. <laughs> right. That's brilliant. Absolutely right. So I, I do need to hire that guy for my marketing team. Yes. He, yeah, he's a clever guy. Um, so so I'm curious, you know, obviously you're 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 accomplished in multi multiple different asset classes. You're actually obviously highly educated. You know, two questions. What first off, what drew you to the real estate world? And then, you know, why did you move from those previous classes that you were talking about, you know, single family homes and, and uh, multifamily into self-storage. Well, I think it's like life, right? You don't, you don't know exactly how you're going to get to where you're going to go, but right. um, you know, for me, the reason why I got pushed into um, and, and I will say pushed into real estate was my parents showed up um, 
family weekend, parents weekend at my you know college, my senior year. And they said, well, what are you going to do when you graduate? I said, well, there's the family business. I thought I would have to be working for the family business or that's the direction you would want me to go right. um, <clears throat> based upon these factors. And they said, no, that's not going to be the case. You know, I was like, well, man, did, oh. I, did I piss off grandpa? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, what, what, Is it something what? I said at Christmas? I don't know, right? <laughs> exactly, right. Like, well, what happened? And uh, they said, no, you didn't piss anybody off this time. Um, we were selling the family business. Wow. And so, it, you know, that, that exactly. That's a that, that's a big change, right? This right. is a this is a business that I've known my entire life. And it's, I was fourth generation. I actually did work there at times. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's a big transition. It's a big change. In fact, I was just talking with a guy today who sold his business. And I'm like, it's a, it's a range of emotions. You're excited and, you know, you're sad, right? Right. And um, so my dad immediately said, well, what do you think about architecture? You know, you liked it in high school. You, you took classes in high school. I'm like, I thought I wrote it off because I, I chose um, a liberal arts education. One, because um, I thought it'd be a good broad education. And two, um, I wanted to play sports. So I played um athletics in college mm -hmm. and if, three if i thought i went to an architecture school and, I, and it didn't pan out for me i thought i'd be bored as hell at a tech school right and so i was like do i want to have a fun college experience or do i want to have a risky college experience right and so i, I chose fun you know like when, when 18 year old doesn't choose fun right right and um so they i was fortunate enough that they just come out with this new program where you were able to get a master's degree in architecture without having an undergraduate in architecture wow and so um and then when I got there, I quickly learned that it was not the architect who really controls projects. It's the developer. Mm -hmm. So after my first year, my first semester of, uh, you know, introductory uh, studio that we all had to do, I got connected with a professor who owned a real estate development architecture and contracting company. Wow. And it was because of that, we were actually working on real projects. And so, um, the, he showed, I was his TA and he said, okay, we're going to be putting together this program, 50 acres, thousand condominiums, go home and come back with a design in two days. And so, um, that was the, you know, the beginning of my, my real estate career because, um, ultimately he selected my plan and that went into a PUD. And while I was working there for the next six years with him, um, we actually worked on that project. Wow. Yeah. But talk about a fire hose. Holy cow. Absolutely. So during the day, you know, in the beginning of the, the day, when I was in his office, because his TA had to work for him in his office, right? I was doing all the financial modeling because I was the only one who could read and write. All the other classmates were just drafter, you know. Right. And then I would go to school and work on the drawings, and then go home and do homework and work on the drawings. Right. So I, I was working like eighteen hours a day for him. And it sounds like, can, by the smile on your face, you were loving every minute of it. I mean, I was enjoying it because, sure. it, it, you know, I will, I will say this, the undergraduates did not have the same perspective as me as the graduate yeah. student, yeah. you know, as an undergraduate, you're like, Hey, I still want to go out and have fun. Right. They're that 18 year old me at 21 years, 22 years old. I was like, this is my career. I'm ready to really focus in on this. So I realized what I was sacrificing, but I also recognized what the payoff was going to be. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, so let's talk about Coda management right now. So um, tell me about your business and, and uh, you know, what kind of projects you're working on these days? So we're working on a, a range of things. We, we liquidated our multifamily back around 17, 18, and we've been focusing on self-storage. So we have products from Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, three in Ohio, Kentucky, um, Virginia, and Maine. And so we've just been developing this portfolio of self-storage facilities across the Midwest and East Coast. And the idea of it is to take underperforming properties or buildings and convert them into self-storage. And so of the portfolio that we have, only one is we bought that is existing where we're doing where we did no improvements on it. All we did is put an automatic gate, an electronic gate and some cameras, but we didn't expand the performa at all. So everything else is strictly development. And so we're looking at improving the property through developing the asset. And so when you, when you look at a, you know, a shell or, you know, some sort of uh, non-performing asset and, you know, what are you looking for in that property that kind of would indicate that it's a good fit for your, your business model? 
Well, the first thing is we study the demographics, and that was something that was really not in, in play when we were doing multifamily. Sure. Um, we, we would look at, you know, square foot of lockers per capita. We'll look at the density. We'll look at the growth. We'll <clears throat> look at the medium income and what percentage are renters and what percentages are businesses in the area. And so we will be studying a three mile radius and we will base our decision first and foremost on that. And then two, does the building align with what we need? So is it big enough? Does it have tall enough ceilings? Does this, is the structure strong enough to hold 125 pounds per square foot? Right. Um, you know, accessibility. These are some of the factors that we all take into consideration as well as the zoning. What are the entitlements? And sure. if we don't have them, how difficult will it be to get them? Okay. All right. And so when you acquire a building, you know, and I know this ranges, but is there a certain, you know, timeline that you're looking to hit in order to make the numbers work? Are you looking to get operational within, you know, a year, 18 months? Like how big a project is, you know, a repositioning of a, a large office or, you know, industrial building and turning it into self-storage? Well, typically we'll, we're, we're trying to buy the building well below replacement costs. So we might, you know, the last couple we bought, we're like no more than $2 million, like a million to $2 million for either 80 to 150,000 square feet. Okay. <clears throat> but then we're putting substantial amount of money into them. So we're putting anywhere from three to $4 million into them. So the project that we're working on now in Bay City is an expansion as well as a new construction. And so like we bought the property for nine acres for $150,000, wow. you know, just you know, just an incredible price. Right. But then yeah. we, we re-entitled it. We got the zoning done. So that way we could progress with it. And then we're buying another facility and we're expanding, but we're, we're between the two facilities, we're going to be putting in $6 million into construction. Okay. And then at the, at the end of the day, you know, from a return perspective, you know, what does a building like that, you know, how do you value a building like that? Is it, it's on NOI, I assume, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it, it ultimately it's commercial real estate. So you're looking at NOI. Right. But also it's a retail business, right? So you're looking at absorption, you're looking at lease up, you're looking at um, physical occupancy versus economic occupancy, and then how to manage expenses. So in 2021, we actually, st we founded it or started One Stop Self Storage in response to the marketplace. And so we were having some troubles with the, the big third party REITs and uh, felt it was more advantageous for us to start our own brand. And so we, we launched our own brand. Uh, we brought in four buildings at, in uh, 2021, mm -hmm. and then we've just been adding to that portfolio since that period of time. Fascinating. And so, you know, I, and I'm curious, you know, in terms of, um, you know, your approach and, uh, you know, that I know, I know there are a lot of people out there that would love to get into self-storage. You know, last figure I saw, I think it was like about 72% of the operating self-storage units in the, in the country were, uh, mom and pops, and it doesn't sound like you're acquiring those. Um, is that part of your is that part of your focus at all? Is there any sort of uh, view? Because you did mention one of them was a was an ar already established as a self storage facility. Um, do you yeah, look our, at those as well, or is it just is it simply focused on industrial? No, no. I mean, our our one in Jackson, Michigan, was owned by a mom and pop, and. Um, the guy built it himself and what wow. we're looking to do is just improve the performance by raising the rents. Right. It was a uh, 40% below market rate. Whoa. And so um, the other one that we're buying in Bay city, Michigan, um, the nine acres and combined with another site was another mom and pop. And we're taking that one and expanding them and combining the two sites. So on that one, we will have everything from uncovered parking to non-climate control, to climate control, to boat and RV covered parking, to enclosed boat and RV. And so we will have the, the full spectrum of self-storage options on, on those on those sites. Interesting. And, you know, one of the things that you, you had said that was interesting to me is the, the circle the, the around that building, when you're only looking at three miles uh, around that building, that's a, that's a really tight market. Is that, is, is that for, you know, looking at the the business do you look beyond that in terms of opportunity or are your customers really within that three mile circle well the reason we say three to five miles is it's ultimately it comes down to how far someone's willing to travel for it sure right so um you know you're you're in connecticut and you're familiar with new york city i'm sure that yeah. you know 20 minutes means one block Right. <laughs> so, you know, th that radius is even going to be smaller in, sure. in New York City, but 
out in the rural country, 20 minutes could be 80 miles, you know, depending yeah. on how fast you're driving, right? So right. Yeah, it's four or five towns away, right? Exactly. Right. So it really comes down to about a 20, 25 minute commute. And so okay. on average, that's three to five miles. Yeah, because it's interesting. You know, I live in a I live in, in central Connecticut and, you know, our town probably has you know, somewhere between nine and 10,000 people. We have two storage facilities in, in town on either ends. And, you know, I don't know, as the, as the crow flies, it may be three to five miles. But, you know, it's interesting. I, I just I look at, you know, I'm curious about whether or not population has anything to do with 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 that. Or is it more about, um, you know, looking at you know, when you look at demographics or a location and you start analyzing it, um, you know, what are some of the other things that you look at is obviously po population density, New York versus rural, you know, Michigan. Um, but, you know, what else are you looking at to decide how many of these can you put in a particular region? Well, the typical saturation, let's let's take New York and Florida and yeah, Texas out of this. Outliers, right. um, market saturation is typically around seven square feet of lockers per capita. Um, okay. New York used to be nine, but now we're seeing like 11 and 13 in Florida. They're developing with 13 down there. Wow. So, I mean, those are really the outliers. So we're always trying to go into a marketplace where we're below seven so that we know if we come in, there is demand for us. Right. And um, so what we're looking for is not just what the population is and what the square footage per capita, but we will also look at what the medium income is uh -huh. and what percentage of renters. So like if you're out in rural Texas, um, you know, typically things that kill self-storage are attics, basements, and garages uh, okay? Okay. Where, where people can store stuff. Now, if you live out in the middle of Texas, then you have a big front yard and you can just put stuff out in your, you know, you can put up a <laughs> barn or whatever it is, right? right? right. So, you know, in those areas, those are the outliers where if, if we're looking at your community, for instance, and I see a lot of one car garages from an aerial, aerial view and everyone's parking on the driveway, it's a pretty good indication that there's a need for self-storage. Right. Um, but generally speaking, if we see that the saturation is like at four, then we know that there really is a market for that. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So, so it's, it's fascinating that, you know, the, the, the higher the rental population, the more likely it is that the market needs, am I hearing you right? That the market needs rental or. Uh, well, rent renters are a big component of it, but there's also like 50% of our tenants are businesses. Okay. And, and so, you know, especially what's changed in the post pandemic is people use their homes differently right now. So they're using right. them as offices, they're using them as school rooms, they're using them as gyms. And so, you know, that extra space that they had down in their basement or in the, you know, bedroom is now, those things and they need to push that the storage stuff out into other else. locations. Right. Makes sense. Makes sense. So okay. So let's let's talk about you a little bit more. Um so in well, terms this is of, the scary part. Uh, this is terrifying. <laughs> uh these are the really hard questions. So brace yourself. Um no I'm just curious, you know, being an entrepreneur and you've been doing this for a while, uh I, I'm sure you meet people all over the place that would love to get into your part of the business. And and uh so you know what do you think separates um successful entrepreneurs like you from the people that want to get into this business, want to, you know, uh, that dream about this business and, you know, and, uh, you know, what have you done differently that they haven't done yet? Well, let, let me take it a little bit further back. Cause I, I've also taught college architecture and, and done coaching in real estate and business. Sure. And for me, there's, there's really like two types of people, you know, when we began teaching, you know, at the beginning of the semester, we would ask everyone, what was their, what was their goal for the class? Right. And, 90% of the people would say an A. <laughs> the 10% would say, I want to learn this about design or I want to learn this detailing. I, I want to learn better about construction or whatever it may be. In reality, it was everyone who said they wanted an A never got an A. Right. And the people who didn't say they wanted an A ended up getting an A. Right. And it's not because we were biased towards it. We told everyone, we don't give A's. We don't give B's. We don't give C's. Right. You know, you earn it. You right. know, so we're going to tell you what it's going to take to earn these grades. And if you do these things, you will earn it. It, it makes our job very easy. And um, it's it's like life, right? You, right? you know, everybody says that they want to do these things. And when I was coaching, I'd say, what what is it that, what do you want to get out of here? And everyone would say, well, I want to be this or I want to be that. But the first thing is that mindset is like, I'm going to do this. Right. And I think that's the difference between people who are um, more entrepreneur in nature and those that are not, I mean, I think you can learn to be more entrepreneurial 
But I think the people that have the pro propensity for it are the ones that are willing to say, I'm going to do this or I am doing this versus saying, I want to do this. Right. And, and yeah. go ahead. no, please keep going. So I, I think that's the, that's the biggest thing is the mindset, you know, um, is it cut out for everybody? And I'm going to say, no, it's not. Um, there's a tremendous amount of risk and there's a tremendous amount of rejection. And, you know, for every one loan that you get, there's 10 banks that might say no to you, right. You know, and for every time you go to an entitlement or you put your product out there for someone, you know, every time we put our product out there, someone's either choosing us or choosing another self-storage facility. So there's, there's plenty of rejection as being an entrepreneur and you, you have to learn how to improve and grow and, and develop. Right on, right on. Yeah. And I, th I think, uh, I think passion um, plays a big part in that as well, because, you know, like you were saying, it, it's not a matter, it, there's kind of two things that I, that resonated with me when I was hearing your, your perspective that, you know, one is that somebody's coming in like for your coaching and, and your, your class, um, they want to learn something, right? It's not a matter of checking the box and getting the grade. It's about uh, adding a skill or, you know, adding knowledge. And then the other piece of it, like you were saying, is it's not a, I want to, it's I must, right? And there's a huge right. difference. Right. I mean, it's it's interesting that the, the point of the, the person, not the point, the perspective of an employee is like, I'm owed this money for my paycheck. Right. You know, the owner's perspective is, I got to earn this money to pay people. Yeah. And, and you might be the one getting paid last. And so, you know, that's, there's a, there's a, a difference. And when I was, we brought on a, um, a guy to be our director of construction. And I said, Hey, look, you got to get these construction draws done. And he's like, Oh, I'll get to it. And I'm like, no, you need to get them in because guess what? That's where your salary comes from. You know, if we don't get those fees in, right. there's no money to pay you. Right. And he's like, okay, now I get it. Like, yeah. Highly no, motivated just... now. Thanks, boss. Right? <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm not yeah. trying to be a jerk about it, but where do you think oh, the money reality, comes from? Right? right. There's an economic reality here. Um, exactly. you, you know, and it's 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 interesting you say that because I I had uh you know I had a, a a boss back in my technology days, uh, Rob Bernstein. And he he said, you know, I look. I said, how do you look at employees? Like, you know, how do you approach that? And he said, I'm making an investment in every single one of them. Right. And with, and what he meant was he's expecting a return for that investment. You're going to pay me a dollar. I'm going to deliver five, 10, 15, a hundred dollars back in value. Um, and if I'm not, well, then that's, that's a thing, right? That becomes a thing. Absolutely. Um, You're either an asset or a liability. That's it. So, so, I mean, like when my kids started working they're like, they go to work and they're like, oh yeah, it's good. No one came in today. And I'm like, do you realize what you're saying? That you didn't right. produce any income for your company in order to pay you. <laughs> right. Right. They're like, Oh yeah. Oh, Oh yeah. 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 That's right. I get it. That my boss isn't infinitely wealthy and just pays people out of uh, the kindness of her heart, his or her heart. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, so I'm curious, you know, when you look at, um, you know, sharpening the saw, as they say, uh, you, you know, time was, I, you know, the old axiom uh, leaders are readers. Right. Um, but nowadays, the the way that people consume information varies widely between, you know, audible audio books and actual tactile books and and uh, uh, YouTube videos and podcasts and conferences and all that. You know, I'm curious. Two questions here. You know, one is, you know, how do you consume information? How do you get smarter? You know in terms of what you, you do and, and, you know, what are you paying attention to these days in terms of information sources? Uh, I, I, some people in my family might argue that I don't know if I'm getting smarter, but. Yeah, I have kids too. <laughs> <laughs> so the way, the way in which I learn is um, combination. Um, you know, I've, I've had mentors. I mean, we've talked about one uh, already, my first employer. And then um, I've had another mentor who I respect immensely. And um, he's actually the president of a university now. And so um, learned a tremendous amount from him. And that was having conversations with him. It was going and, and listening to his programs. It was being involved with him. Sure. Um, and I'm, I'm doing a program right now. So I'm finishing up a two and a half year investment that I've done in terms of leadership. And so a, a big part of that program was meeting quarterly. And there, there was also times of reflection built into that program, you know, significant times of reflection. And then there was also reading. And so it was a combination of all those things. I don't, 
I don't think that you can do one without the other. Or, and I, you know, the reading could be blogs. It could be books. I mean, a lot of ours were, were books that on other people's perspectives on elements yeah. of what we were studying. Um, but I'm, I'm always consuming, um, you know, I subscribe to different things um, to see what's going on across the board in real estate, not just right. my segment. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking at what brokers are saying about the economy. I'm studying uh, politically what's happening. I'm studying, you know, what the fiscal policy is versus the monetary policy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was predicting this recession um, back at the beginning of the year. In fact, I, in March, I was saying, hey, we're going to have we're going to be in a recession. Right. And everyone's like, oh, no, no, the economy is going great. Look at the housing and this and that. I'm like, that's one of the reasons why I'm saying we're going into recession. Right. Um, but if if I hadn't been a, a student of different, you know, different varieties of information, I might not have been able to pick that up. Sure. Yeah. I mean, pattern recognition is is imperative for, you know, people in our business and the seats we sit in. Right. And, you know, being able to take advantage of a whole bunch of different information sources is is uh, really crucial. Um, so, so in terms of the, let's talk about the recession, you know, from your perspective, uh, you know, where are we in that economic cycle and, and how bumpy is it really going to get, you know, opening up well, and caveat, 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 right. We're just talking here and we're not offering economic uh, advice, but, you know, I'm just curious what your perspective is on, on where we are in the cycle. Yeah. I mean, I, I would argue that we hit the recession when we had two consecutive quarters of de downward trend. I mean, that's the pure definition sure. of recession. And a lot of people were arguing that and whether or not there was political biases or not, I don't really care. I'm, I'm just looking at the facts. Like this right. is what the definition is. This is where we are. Um, you know, in my study of this is there's, it's tied, always tied to political, you know, and in fact, I've been, I've been wrong historically based upon the last two, somewhat wrong in the last two elections. You know, I, I said that if you look back on the historical, how our country has voted presidents in, we've given them all eight years to either prove, sink or swim. Right. You know, the first four years is a, you know, a warm up, if you will. And then the second four years, and then we get sick of that policy and then we switch. Right. And if you look back, it's been flipping and flopping back and forth on an eight year pattern with a couple of exceptions, Jimmy Carter. That was probably the one of the worst economic, it was the worst economic recession that we had was 1979 and 80. Yeah. Um, I actually compared this year, this coming year, back to that. And my whole analysis was, I went back and looked at about 10 data points and saw a bunch of comparisons. Like, you know, the price of gas was one of them. Back in 1979, the price of gas was the equivalent of two dollars and thirty five cents in, in current dollars? Here in Chicago, we hit six dollars. Yeah, you know, we, I was looking at unemployment. Yeah, I was looking at unemployment. I was looking at housing starts. Housing starts were declining. I was looking at how much the um, interest rates had climbed. I mean, nineteen seventy nine interest rates were nine and ten percent. Yeah, you know, right now the the Fed their only fiscal policy that they can do is raise interest rates in order to stymie inflation. So they had massive inflation back then, and we're we're tapering it now. We're we're beginning to pump the brakes, but ultimately, I, I thought with this midterm that it would have been a more of a reflection on the economy, and I was wrong on that. Yeah. Usually, America votes on the economy, but there was two other um, two other major topics that came up that pushed America's perspective of the economy away, and it didn't really alter two things, but. My prediction of where we stand in the economy is if we be continue this path, it will force a change and Biden will be a one term similar to um, Carter. And I'm not saying I'm pro or against Biden. I'm just saying historically, I'm looking at it. Yeah. If the economy continues, unless something else pops up, there will be a change. And I think that change is where we will see the economy change, because right now we're following a fiscal, a monetary policy, which is driving more of the the recession than anything else at this point in time. Yeah. So do you see a soft landing or are we uh, run, are we careening towards a brick wall or a cliff? Oh, I, I don't think it's going to be a cliff like 08, 09. I mean, that, that was just a massive cliff. I, I, you know, I think it's more of the boiling water. It's, it's going to be a point where are we fed up enough? Right. And, you know, at the midterms, we weren't really fed up enough. That's what it told me. It's like there wasn't enough pain. And I think there wasn't enough pain because, people have, we're still spending. 
Right. You know, that's that's the one factor in this recession that's not the which is different than 1979 yeah. is that there was so much money pushed into the economy that they had money to spend. This year, yeah. people are starting to pull back their belts. You know, they're beginning to tighten them. Yeah, so I think that is definitely, uh, I'm sorry. But yeah, you're right. Savings are being eaten into. And that's when right. people, you know, I don't like this. This isn't feeling so good. Right. You know, I think the other difference is if, you know, back in the 70s, so I was a kid back then, I think you were too. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, uh, you know, I, I remember, uh, you know, people losing their jobs and not being able to find, new, you know, a, a new job. And here, uh, it, to a certain extent, if you want a job, you can get a job. It may not be the job you just left, you know, at, at that level, but um, there is work to be done and work to be had, um, at least here in the Northeast. That's what I'm seeing. There, I would agree with you that, but I think that it's beginning to change now too, because there's now more, le- in the past, it was really easy to get a job, like in the end of 2022, right. and now people are getting let off. Right. You know, that, that wasn't, people were quitting in 2022 right. over a $1, $2 difference in raise or whatever it is. Right. And um, now people are getting fired. You know, we just hired a guy who got fired from his job. You know, you didn't hear about that in 2022. No, but I also think that that, that presents a great opportunity for companies like ours in that, you know, as those A players do get laid off, you know, because it, usually it's a first in first out kind of thing, right? Um, at least right. In a lot of cases. And so, you know, that puts a lot of really talented people on the street and gives firms like ours, yours, mine, and, and others, the opportunity to hire somebody that probably wouldn't have paid attention to us three years ago uh, because we're too small or, you know, not growing fast enough or whatever, right? Um, they wanted a new sexy job to go work at like Salesforce or, you know, Google or something. And, uh, you know, you know, firms like ours, if real estate is a place where they think they would thrive, you know, it's an, it's interesting that startups and, and, you know, mid-sized companies really do have a great opportunity in recession to, to, to hire some really top-notch talent. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the other part of that is accountability, right? You know, if someone wasn't in their job, they're like, well, fire me. I don't care. I'll go with another one. Right. And right. they would end up leaving because you couldn't afford to fire them. Right. Not now people are like, yeah, I, I can't afford to pay this. Yeah. I hear you. So, so in terms of, um, you know, the, the, your business and, you know, you mentioned you just hired somebody, are you in hiring mode or are you, uh, are you standing put right now? What do you say? No, we're, 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 we're looking to expand. We're looking to grow. So, um, we're bringing more of the the self storage components of the management in house, and so um, we we will be exp- we are expanding. So it's not yeah. we will we are expanding. So so self storage is is similar in terms of like it's multifamily that you know nothing's recession proof right, but certainly resistant. I mean, is that is that your perspective as well? Yeah, I went back and studied um, the last four major recessions, and I, I included the pandemic and that, even though it wasn't, it wasn't uh, two quarters, we just had that massive dip for, it was really a month right? Um, in March where, you know, everything came to a standstill. And what we saw was that self-storage actually occupancy actually um, increased in every really? recession. Yeah. So what drives that? Uh, well, what drives, basically what drives self-storage is you know, people are experiencing pain. You know, it's transition, disposition, divorce, you know, um, you know, their house is too small, they can't move, whatever it is. Right. And so it, it's a relief valve. And so it's a way of right. addressing that pain or let, let, let's look at supply chain for businesses. I don't have, I don't have enough space for inventory. I need temporary space mm-hmm. because I need to buy a thousand 10 foot, you know, conduit of pipe right. or iron pipe that it's, if I wait a week, it's going to be gone. Right. And I'm not going to go out and buy a new warehouse to, to house that. So, right. you know, you, you become an outlet. I get it. Wow. That's really interesting. Um, so, so Scott, it, you, you know, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I'm curious about you as a person. So when you're not uh, finding, you know, solving people's storage problems, <laughs> right. Um, what do you like to do? How do you spend your time? Well, my, uh, it's going to be changing, you know, so my, oh. uh, my youngest is going off to college. She graduated early from high school to go play college soccer Wow, cool. And so um, we're going to be adjusting a little bit here. We, a couple different things. One, we're host parents for three kids at Northwestern currently that are from Africa. Nice. So we have a, a junior, a sophomore and a freshman. So, um, you know, they, we're involved in their lives and they keep us a little bit busy. 
and they're always fun to have around. Um, we live close to the lake. And so, you know, I, during most of the year I'm paddle boarding or, you know, out on the lake and my youngest certainly enjoys the lake. Yeah, so absolutely. we're sailing, doing things down there all the time. And so a lot of that has to do with family. So, you know, we always look for ways to incorporate our family into those things. And so those are the, yeah, being an entrepreneur or a business owner, you know, that's one of the beauties of, of what, what we do, right. Is time, time freedom in particular, right. Time management. I don't know if there's ever freedom. We yeah. always have a limited yeah. amount of time, right? Yeah. You go to soccer games. I go to softball games. Same thing, right? So I, yeah. We just, on the way there, I'm on the phone. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so Scott, if, if folks want to learn more about uh, you or your business, um, you know, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Well, Ed, thanks for doing that. And yeah. if people reach out to us and it's info at CODA, C-O-D-A, mg for management group.com that's info at coda mg.com and they want to learn more about self-storage we have two free gifts for them um cool. one is a feasibility study which is a report that we hired third parties to do about a site and it explains why we should or should not go into that site and why we picked it but it also describes the self-storage industry wow it's that's a right. 100 page report and then um the other one's a, a self-storage deal analyzer. And so we will, if they reference this show, we will send those to them. And if you have questions, we'd be more than happy to have a conversation with them. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. We'll be sure to put that in the show notes as well so that uh, it's easy to click on. Absolutely. So, awesome. So Scott Crone, thank you so much for your time today. It's truly been a pleasure. I learned a lot and, I, and I'm, um, I'm grateful for your time. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Hey, man, you have a fascinating business. It really is interesting. So, hey, this is Ed Matthews again with the Real Estate Underground. I'm still here with Scott Crone. And uh, after we uh, stopped the main show, uh, Scott dropped a, a gigantic gold nugget. And I begged him to stick around for 10 or 15 minutes to explain this to us. Um, Scott, you want to talk to us about blockchain? Absolutely. So one of the things that we've been working on is integrating a blockchain technology into self-storage. And one of the things that people might not understand about blockchain is I, I do believe it's going to be the technology of the future, especially with regard to transactions like title, um, title work and title companies are going to be integrating this. And the idea of a blockchain, for those who aren't familiar with it, it's a contract. It, so if you have, for instance, equity investors coming in, you have the debt coming in, you have the seller coming in, the, the purchaser, and then when all these things are aligned, that contract is formalized, and then the, the blockchain is what holds all of those contracts, and it's dispersed across the internet to yep. be secure. Right. And so with blockchain, you can have micro-investors because people could buy with one coin or two coin. The byproduct of the blockchain is the crypto or a coin, mm -hmm. and we've named it Store. And so we're going to be launching the Store technology here in Q1 of 2023. And the idea of it is there's two products of it. One that people will be able to invest on a micro level or on either equity or debt mm -hmm. and, and development of self-storage or operations of self-storage facilities. But then two, customers who come in and for the self-storage will be able to pay with their store coin. So they will be able to have the crypto to pay for it. But then also if they move from one city to the next, we have this network of different storage facilities that are all gonna be utilizing the store coin they're part of our self-storage mastermind. And so people will be able to transfer their coin from one place to the next and not or get credits for it. So regardless of whether or not, let, you know, it's ABC storage or Coda Management Group or, um, you know, some other entity, uh, they will be able to, to move from one one's, um, property to the other, regardless of who owns it? Correct. Wow. Because we're all going to be utilizing the same blockchain or token. Right. So the idea would be like, if you go into one and it says like, we accept Visa, you know, before when, you know, when you and I were younger, we talked about that earlier, you know, it was like, is this a Visa store? Is this a MasterCard or right. is this a Amex, right? Right. And, um, you know, you couldn't use any other thing and you could only use that one. Yep. So within that, we will have store facilities and you'll be able to use the coin to pay at different store facilities. Brilliant. And so, so how does, how does the rollout work with something like that? Well, a, a lot of it is in compliance, right? So we've had to do white papers to making sure that the coin and the blockchain technology are um, accepted. 
that are proven out that there's a need, there's a purposefulness for it. So we're, we're just not quote unquote, creating a coin with no purpose, right? That there's an intentionality behind the blockchain. So what they do is they evaluate the need of the blockchain. And then what is the contract for that blockchain? And that's going to be for the facilitating of self storage facilities across the country. And so um, that whole, there's white papers and then, you know, you have to get it approved and, right. you know, you're, you're going before the SEC and all these different things in order to make sure that your, your compliance is all there. And then once that has happened, then the, the mining of the coin will begin where there'll be a, an offering for that. And that will be launching of the store token, which okay. will then create the blockchain. And so where are you in that? I'm just curious, where are you in that process now? We're, we're finalizing it. So we have all the modeling done in terms of um, how to buy it, you know, what it will look like, all those sorts of things. It's just a matter of dotting the I's and crossing the T's and, and launching it this, this year. So it's, it's uh, in 2023, this is going to become a real thing. Absolutely. We've been working on it for about two years. Wow. That's fantastic. Very interesting. Well, Hey, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you let me uh, hit the record button one more time because <laughs> Uh, this is fascinating stuff and it's, uh, you know, obviously going to be a huge value to your customers as well as your investors for that matter. And I, and I do think it's not, it's not just going to be in self storage. It's going to be how all, most real estate transactions are going to be occurring. I, I really see title companies taking on this technology because if you think about it, there's no difference in, in, in any title transaction. All these parties are coming together, but now it will be in secured, you know, encrypted, um, formats that you know you can't take you can't mess with you can't alter right. those things right right fascinating I, i'm i think it's only a matter of time before someone figures it out how to bring it to the multifamily world as well um which i i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing but you know progress is usually a good thing so we try right yeah that's right the whole point. Exactly. exactly well scott uh once again thank you so much for your time and i appreciate you dropping that last gold nugget for me and the audience and uh I look forward to con uh, talking with you again soon. Sounds good. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks. This has been the Real Estate Underground Podcast, a Clark Street Capital presentation. Thanks for joining us. If you're enjoying the show, please remember to subscribe and share it with your friends. If you'd like to learn more about Clark Street Capital and our upcoming projects, please join our investor club at clarkst.com slash join. Until next time, happy investing. This has been the Real Estate Underground. Don't forget to subscribe. It helps us grow. Until next time, undergrounders, remember your real estate journey begins with a simple step forward. Now get to it. Bye for now.